every single championship is on the line as the WWE presents Clash of Champions live September 15th, 2019 from Charlotte, North Carolina. Will Kofi Kingston's storybook run as WWE Champion continue, or will the Viper Randy Orton become the new World Wrestling Entertainment Champion? Sasha Banks and Becky Lynch clash over the Raw Women's Championship in a highly contested matchup. Who will leave with the Raw Women's Championship? Will the WWE Raw Tag Team Champions Seth Rollins and Braun Strowman implode? And who will leave as the undisputed Universal Champion when Seth and Braun collide later in the night in the main event? Strap in, get psyched, this is WWE Clash of Champions. How's it going everybody? Welcome once again to another episode of the J to Z Pro Wrestling Breakdown. Today we are taking a look at WWE's Clash of Champions event. And for the first time ever, we are partnered up with Scott Keith and the Blog of Doom. What's up all you Blog of Doom readers out there? If this is the first time you're ever checking us out, we do want to suggest that you guys hit that thumbs up button. Go ahead and click that subscribe button if you like what you see. This is the J to Z Pro Wrestling Breakdown, and we are live in the J to Z Pro Wrestling Control Center. Like I said, we are paired up with one of the brightest, the most famous wrestling minds on the internet. It's Scott Keith. I've been a massive fan of Scott Keith back from the Ransylvania days, the RSPW fact days. This... This is a big moment because for the first time ever, J to Z TV, we are the official Blog of Doom, WWE Clash of Champions correspondent, and we're about to dive headfirst into the show, guys. Super excited for this partnership. Without further ado, let's take a look at WWE Clash of Champions. All right, guys, we are going to kick things off with the WWE Clash of Champions kickoff show. It's the pre-show, and there's a couple of big matches going down, title matches. Every single title is on the line tonight. The pre-show is no different. We're going to kick it off with a triple threat match for the WWE Cruiserweight Championship. It's going to be the stretcher himself, Drew Gulak, laying the title on the line in a three-way dance, a triple threat match against Umberto Carrillo, 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 and Lince Dorado. All right, guys, that's kind of a weird hodgepodge of a three-way to start things off here. But at least they're giving uh, some new guys a chance on 205 Live, and that is one of the strengths of 205 Live, is that constantly new faces are pushed into the title into the title picture, and you don't see the same guys hanging around all the time. All right, getting into the match, the pace is set quick from the get-go. Lince and uh, Umberto are going to do some uh, lucha things, if you will, including Dorado coming off the announce table and catching Gulak with a Hurricane Rana. Lince gets wiped out, and Gulak ends up putting Umberto in an arm bar. As I sit here and I wonder why we're doing rest holds in a triple threat match. Odd. Lince comes in and then they end up doing that stupid three-way spot where, you know, it, apparently in these three-way matches you can only break things down and have one-on-one -on -one match matches. You know, where two guys are going at it and then the third guy will roll out and sell and on the floor and we don't see him forever. I don't like this spot in three-way matches. I understand the reasoning to go for going for this, I mean, it allows the action to be a little bit easier to digest and follow, but it's just kind of really formulaic by this point, especially when you see uh, Drew Gulak using rest holds not only on uh, Carrillo in the ring, but then when he rolls out and Lince comes in, Drew ends up putting him in a rest hold. Uh, this time the crowd chants Gulak, but this is so odd. This match is very odd. We got a three-way dance. It's supposed to be constant action, and you've got rest holds. Uh, back out on the floor, they do a, a little electric chair-assisted uh, tope where um, Drew has Dorado, Lince Dorado up on his shoulders, and Carrillo is going to come off the rope with almost like a twisted bliss, tope suicida. It's going to take uh, Lince out. I, I really, really like uh, 
Umberto Carrillo, actually. I think he's a great worker. I think he's got a great look, and I think he has a lot of potential as a babyface, but I think he's been kind of booked pretty poorly on 205 Live. A little bit of start and stop with him. A little bit like they didn't know what they were going to do with him. I don't like the partnership with Gulak and then the weird uh, loose association with the, the Lucha House Party. It's just strange booking. I don't think it's doing him any favors. Uh, there's a little spot where Gulak is going to pick Lince Dorado up like a child almost and actually uses him as a weapon and throws him headfirst right into Umberto. We get a spot where Drew Gulak breaks up a Carrillo pinfall attempt off of the uh, Aztec press, which is sort of like Ultimo Dragon's old school uh, uh, headstand in the corner, and he turns it into almost a split-legged Arabian press or a split-legged moonsault. Gulak's going to post Carrillo off of this, and he's going to lob the Histral Cradle Lince up. But ends up botched because Dorado's shoulders are up and the ref clearly calls it on camera. Said, hey, shoulders. And guess what? Wouldn't you know, Lince Dorado very kindly lays his shoulders down on the mat because the ref said so. One, two, three. That's all she wrote. Botched finish aside. This was a low-key mess, guys. Uh, rest holds. Oddly structured match. Uh, there's hardly any chemistry here between this, these three guys, which kind of surprised me. Uh, everything looked a little botchy and off. Two and one quarter of a star. Not the hottest star, uh, start to the show and a little bit, call, color me a little bit disappointed with those three. I'm a big Drew Gulak fan. I think he's a heck of a worker. Um, this was just a weird hodgepodge. Ugh. That's all I got to say about that one. Moving right along, second match on the pre-show. I guess you could call this the kickoff show main event. What a prestigious spot to be in. And wouldn't you know, the WWE United States titles on the line, AJ Styles putting the title on the line against Cedric Alexander. Styles is out with the OC to start things off, and he's going to send Gallows and Anderson to the back because he's claiming he's going to do this thing all on his own. And then the ref holds the belt upside down, and I have to mark out over that. I don't know why it always tickles me when their belts uh, get hung upside down. I always wonder if Vince is freaking out in Gorilla when he sees a belt get put upside down. They get things going right away as uh, Cedric Alexander is going to catch a charging AJ Styles with a Michinoku driver for a very hot near fall, and the fans really did buy on that one. Uh, and then he's going to follow it up with the diving somersault sent on and the double, the diving swanton to the floor, the plancha, onto AJ. And uh, then he's going to hit that spring, I think he calls it the neuralizer, that springboard spin kick that he does. Hits that. Cedric is a house of fire to start. It's not going to last long though because AJ Styles is going to completely kill Cedric to Alexander dead with a brain buster. Onto the ring apron, and I almost lose my mind over that one. It's a pretty devastating little bump. Then he's going to hit a Styles Clash onto the floor. He roll AJ rolls Cedric in. That looks like it's got to be all one, two. AJ's going to pull Cedric's head up before the count of three. Uh, and then this is, at this point, I notice that Cedric Alexander's ring gear is literally the exact same as AJ Styles. They got knee, the same knee pads, kick pads, the same tights even with the belt loop in them. Even the, I mean, the, lo the logos and the color colors are different on their attire, but they're literally placed in the same exact spots. And this le leads me to believe that the WWE seamstresses, they need to hire somebody new or they need to start doing their own thing because I remember a day when Everybody had their own distinct ring gear, and we're starting to all look alike again. This was a glaring example, and I was not actually very... It was not something that I was happy to notice and point out. Phenomenal forearm connects, Styles Clash finishes, and that's pretty much a squash for you. I mean, that's how they're going to get Cedric over in his hometown. Following the match, back out comes the, the good brothers, Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows are going to come back out, and we're going to get a three-on-one beatdown, and Cedric isn't even going to show any fire. 
He's not going to fight back at all. What's going on with the booking here? Uh, it was almost like this was like a work rate version of the Brock Lesnar Goldberg car crash matches. Where it was just boom, 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 big stuff constantly from the get-go. Um, there's just a more puzzling story and outcome here. I understand if they want to keep things going here. And they want to build to another Cedric AJ match. I thought AJ sh or Cedric should have got a little more heat on AJ in order for there to even be a a uh, an issue to carry out. I mean, Cedric didn't even fight back at all. <laughs> I don't think this made me buy Cedric Alexander as a threat since he got clean. He got beat clean in the ring, and then he just gets destroyed without again without fighting back or showing any fire whatsoever. Weird. We're gonna go two and a half stars. Uh, for this quick little Cedric AJ glorified squash, basically. That's going to do it for the kickoff show. We're kicked off now, guys. It's time to start the main WWE Clash of the Champions show. And first of all, what I would just like to have a moment of silence. Let's, can we all please just have a moment of silence? Rest in peace. We're going to have a moment of silence for the, uh, the word the from the Clash of the Champions name. Okay, that's enough. Like seriously, they got rid of the word the from Clash of the Champions. Just, so I guess Clash of Champions, just ob omitting that word the completely makes this a, uh, a viable living brand now. They've breathed new life into this dead WCW brand. And I guess Vince McMahon really does have to own everything, doesn't he? I mean, omitting the word the, he's just put enough of his fingerprints on it that he owns that now, right? All right, I know, I know, right? Don't apply logic to an illogical situation. I mean, first of all, in WWE, first we had a night of champions. Now things have deteriorated into a by God clash. Let's get on with the clash, guys. Opening things up, of, I mean, was there any other choice? They're working twice tonight, so they got to get into the opening contest. The Raw Tag Team titles are on the line in your opening match. Seth Rollins and Braun Strowman defending against the randomly thrown together team of Robert Roode and Dolph Ziggler. And I'm actually liking the two of them together. There's some weird character chemistry, I'd call it. Their characters seem like they would, they might team up and get along. So let's see. Hopefully some entertaining things can happen with that team. Makes sense you got Seth and Strowman on first because they're most likely closing this show out. Right away, the presentation looks like a legitimate sport where you got some the, uh, the usual pre-match super special ring announcing, but they've got some uh, yellow lighting, that yellow and gold lighting here, accent, accent lighting that they're going to throw up that looks really cool. Great production. Braun is going to clean house to start. And uh, then he's going to tag in Seth, who, is, who Dolph is going to end up spiking into the uh, mats on the floor with a jumping DDT. And Seth Rollins is going to be your face in peril. Uh, they, they do a good job of getting the crowd into it, which is surprisingly, I thought the Cedric thing might have killed the crowd dead. Uh, they do a good job of building Seth up to make a hot tag to Braun here. So, yeah, they do a good job of Seth of building Seth up to make the hot tag to Braun. Braun ends up getting that tag to a nice reaction. He comes in, but he gets cut off. Boom, Seth Rollins is back in. Things eventually break down, and it looks like Braun accidentally charges into, Ro into Robert Roode and sends him flying into Seth Rollins, who's prepping the curb stomp. Dolph's going to take out uh, Braun Strowman. But Robert Roode is going to connect with the glorious DDT. One, two, three, foregone conclusion. Boom. Your Raw Tag Team Champions just imploded. The belts just changed hands. Robert Roode and Dolph Ziggler are your new Tag Team Champions. And we've got our stage set for our universal title match between Seth and Braun for later in the night. Vince Russo is smiling somewhere, bro. One of his favorite... Uh, writing tropes one of his favorite cliches the fighting tag team champions they actually carried the storyline out pretty good here uh good opener logical choice to have uh rude and ziggler go over everybody looked good and played their parts well 
The finish was a little bit off timing wise. I can't complain too much though. Two and three quarters of a star. And then post-match, Braun Strowman is going to blame the loss on Seth Rollins as Charlie Caruso catches up with him backstage. And then Becky Lynch is going to cut a pretty awesome promo on Sasha Banks to hype up their upcoming match. Check out that uh, Becky Lynch promo. The confidence that she has in this promo is textbook. They need to show this kind of promo to uh, kids learn, young wrestlers learning their craft, learning how to cut a promo. You can't teach the confidence here. It's, pr it's, a, it's a sight to see. Next up, the WWE SmackDown Women's Titles on the line. Bailey is going to defend against her four horsemen women's sister, Charlotte. Charlotte is going to open things up with the Yakuza kick right away. She's in her hometown, by the way, of Charlotte, North Carolina. Well, again, we're going to go with that tired start that the AJ Cedric match started with, where Charlotte's going to charge and get a Yakuza kick, a Mafia kick right away for a near fall. Didn't anyone bother uh, getting together with the agents of the other matches, or did anybody bother pointing out that AJ and Cedric started nearly the exact same way? Heel Bailey gets booed very... I needed to point this out real quick. Heel Bailey gets booed very, very, very loudly uh, during the super special ring introductions, and she's just sporting this gloriously dorky smile the whole time, and I love it. Heel Bailey's got a lot of uh, potential, and I think she's going to be an awesome heel. Charlotte basically is going to own Bailey for this entire match, a couple of minutes. They don't get a lot of time here. Bailey ends up exposing the bottom turnbuckle. She, uh, she sends Charlotte face first into that exposed metal turnbuckle, and she's going to get a roll up for the one, two, three out of nowhere. And then she's going to, the best part of the match is Bailey, the way she grabs her belt and just sprints right out of the uh, arena. Heel stuff. I love the heel righteous, ultra righteous Bailey, yet she's going to cheat. Awesome, awesome stuff by Bailey here. She's already knocking the heel stuff out of the work, but awesome stuff by Bailey. I can't really rate this match, though, because it wasn't really a match. This was more of just an angle. So I'm expecting probably Bailey and Charlotte to continue. Again, unrateable. All right, and we're going to go back here to SmackDown. We're going to recap where Shane McMahon fired Kevin Owens because he didn't do a very good job at uh, cosplaying as Nick Patrick from Starcade 97, apparently. He did not screw Chad Gable out of the title or out of his King of the Ring match. Shorty G went over Shane McMahon, and Shane's not too happy about that. So Kevin Owens is fired. Is, uh, is Kevin Owens getting fired going to become like the new big show, turning face, turning heel, cliche? Storyline firings should just kind of like be done with and be a, they should just go the way of the general manager or the uh, authority figure trope because uh, it's a thing of the past. It's played out. Nobody really believes anybody's getting fired anymore, so. Okay. Moving right along. The SmackDown Tag Team Titles are on the line. Next up, the New Day's putting the Tag Team Titles on the line against the Revival. Xavier Woods is wearing a knee brace, selling that knee injury that he suffered at the hands of the uh, Revival. And, of course, Dawson and Wilder are going to uh, waste no time going right for that injured area like sharks to blood. There's an interesting story as uh, Woods is going to end up laid out on the floor. Um, and, basically, Big E is going to be the one isolated in the ring playing. He's going to be your big uh, ebony Ricky Morton. The crowd ends up getting into the match. They do a great job of building to the hot tag uh, to Woods, who ends up recovering and hulking up on the apron, and the crowd gets really behind him as he does so. That's awesome babyface fire. I, you know what? I, I need babyface fire. I need a babyface fire shirt, some, a babyface fire merch, because if there's one thing I love as a wrestling fan, it's a dying art. It's, a, it's showing babyface fire, man. And Xavier Woods shows it here as he gets the hot tag and comes, clears the ring, the knee ends up giving out, though. 
Big E ends up eating a shatter machine on the floor in a pretty impressive spot. And then there's like a neat little spot where uh, Dawson is in the ring and he just eye he just gives Xavier Woods just this calm eyeball look, like his stink eye look, and he tags in Wilder. Woods is not going down with a fight though. Like a couple of jackals, the revival swarm him. He's trying to fight up like a good baby face. Cedric Alexander should have watched Xavier Woods here. And then like true, true heels, Shatter Machine connects, but they're not going to go for the pin. They yell, they, they yell for the knee. Dawson ends up applying a modified Indian death lock to Woods, who's screaming in agony while Dash Wilder's standing on the floor, screaming in Xavier Woods' face. That's it. And he's going to submit. in. We got brand new tag team champions. And by the way, did I mention that when Dawson, when little details, Dawson, when he went to rip the knee brace off of Xavier Woods, uh, just to be an extra big heel, he actually ripped Xavier Woods' tights, too. So, yeah, that's a heel for you guys. Anyway, the Revival are going to be your brand new tag team champions. That is what I call a character-driven finish. That was an awesome, awesome finish, so kudos to whoever came up with that one. This is the type of match that helps everybody involved. Xavier Woods goes down like a true babyface full of fire, fighting all the way to the end. Nobody looks bad. The Revival look like particularly big jerks coming out of this one, just basically trying to hurt Woods to get the title. And then post-match, Dawson and Wilder are going to cut a really, really good, obviously unscripted promo. Um, they probably had bullet points, but it did not sound like it was word for word, and it was laid out very well by these two guys. The Revival are stars. This is a star-making performance from everybody. I'm glad they went all in on Dash and Scott. We're going to go three and a half stars. Solid, solid tag team match. Next up, Charlie Caruso is going to interview the women's tag team champions, Nikki Cross and Alexa Bliss. And uh, awkwardness ensues. R-Truth and Carmella are strangely moonlighting as uh, camera production crew here. And R-Truth drops the boom mic right into the shot. Alexa's upset that her interview time's been interrupted. So she alerts everyone to R-Truth and Carmella's presence. They chase them off and we're off to the races. Next up, it's the women's tag team titles on the line. Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross are going to team up to put the titles on the line against Sonya Deville and Mandy Rose. It's the team of fire and desire. Alexa Bliss is in full Margot uh, Robbie Harley Quinn garb here. And uh, she's also in full baby face mode tonight, guys. And you can tell by the way she's working, the way that she's selling. Alexa Bliss as a baby face. It's just, watching her work in this match just made me realize that Alexa Bliss is a highly underrated worker, and she's come a long way, especially for somebody with as little experience in the business as she does have. Alexa Bliss is, is incredibly talented. But we're talking about incredibly talented, and we're talking about Nikki Cross, one of my absolute favorites to watch. And she's quickly going to set the uh, she's gonna set the next gif, the next big gif. I mean, we had Chris Jericho and a little bit of the bubbly a couple weeks ago. Now we're going to have Nikki Cross and her doing the Mandy Rose Sable-esque poses and taunts as she's mocking Mandy early on, and it's pretty funny. And then a neat little spot, R-Truth and the 24-7 Circus are going to end up all running down into the ring, interrupting the match briefly. And then in a neat little spot, Alexa Bliss actually ends up rolling R-Truth up and getting catching a near fall on him, almost becoming the 24-7 champion. That kind of stuff actually paid off that awkward uh, segment earlier. This show's actually paced very well and formatted very well. We're going to hit on that later. But back into the match, uh, yeah, they, the, the spot where the R-Truth, the 24-7 stuff, it actually worked, kind of worked here because they kept it so brief. They got everybody in and out. It was just a quick little joke. And then, then the two women's teams went back to working. Bliss ends up uh, getting isolated, and she does a really good job of selling. I mean, she's selling a lot differently here than she'd sell as a heel, and she just does a great job of it. Facial expressions and everything are in top notch. 
Who put this match order together, though, is is what sticks out to me because WWE has this problem with their tag team division where every single tag team match is structured and formatted the same way. You've got baby faces uh, shining at the beginning. You've got heels that take over and control the middle portion of the match so you get the face and peril segment. And then you build up to the hot tag and then eventually the finish. Well, the problem is, is this is our third tag team match and it's our only fourth match of the night. So we've already seen three other segments nearly identical to this. A little bit of organization needs to be put in. The format of the show otherwise was pretty spectacularly done, front-loading all the tag matches onto the front of the card. So we end up, this. By, like I said, this is the third time we've seen this tonight. So it's, it loses all specialness. And the crowd is starting to die a little bit here. Bliss ends up going up to the top rope later on. She looks like she's going to be hitting Twisted Bliss, but Sonya Deville is going to yank her right off the top rope. And then she's going to get hit with that total elimination V-trigger combo by Fire and Desire. That's going to... That's a cover at one. Two, is that it? Nikki Cross breaks it up. That's actually a convincing near fall. They actually had me with that one. Cross... Nikki Cross gets the hot tag, comes in, cleans house. She drapes Mandy Rose up on the top rope. Uh, almost like a, a totally Blanchard draping suplex. Or a slingshot suplex, but she's going to drape Mandy on the top rope and then hit her with the Twisted Sister. I think that's what they used to call it. That, uh, that or Perry Saturn used to call it the Moss-Colored Three-Handled Family Gradunzo. So we're going to say Nikki Cross hits the Moss-Colored Three-Handled Family Gradunzo. One, two, three. And that's all she wrote. They're still tag team champions, Alexa and Nikki Cross. And Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross were both particularly good to together tonight, even more so than they usually are, and the two of them are usually an absolute treat to watch. Uh, like I said, the match placement hurt the match, if anything. Two and a half stars. Next up on the show, the Intercontinental Championship is on the line as Shinsuke Nakamura with Sami Zayn in his corner is going to defend the title against The Miz. And uh, right off the bat, I do have to point out that Shinsuke Nakamura's red entrance cape is just the epitome of swag. It's swagalicious. I love it. Nakam Something about Nakamura with a cape is awesome. Uh, Sami Zayn gets the mic and he provides running commentary for the beginning of this match, basically screaming at uh, Nakamura and uh, to lay it in, lay it in, lay it in. Kind of a funny little bit. It's funny, but then uh, thankfully they they cut uh, Sami's mic after only a few minutes. It, it basically totally overshadowed what the guys were doing in the ring and it took the crowd completely out of it. Uh, good call. Call me crazy, guys, but who would have ever thought that Shinsuke Nakamura and The Miz would have such insanely good chemistry together? They, these guys look like they were made together. Honestly, I don't think Nakamura has looked, uh, he's looked just about as good here as he has since he's come up to the main roster. And honestly, I haven't seen him have instant chemistry with somebody like uh, The Miz since... That first match he had in NXT with Sami Zayn in his debut, uh, WrestleMania weekend 2016. So, pretty pretty crazy. Uh, they do a lot of, of they do a lot of nice little chain wrestling sequences here, uh, and Miz really does have a talent in making others look good, and he makes Nakamura look pretty pretty darn good here in this matchup. Uh, Miz ends up targeting the leg, and they do a great job of building up to the uh, uh, figure four, of course, in Flair Country, and that's going to get a nice little reaction. Miz is going to end up locking that on after Nakamura botches a Kinshasa. Sami Zayn ends up nailing the Miz from behind, behind the ref's back for a near fall. It's actually a convincing near fall. Nakamura is going to miss the Kinshasa for a second time. Skull crushing finale hits to a big, big pop. But Sami Zayn's going to distract the referee. Miz is going to come out and chase Sami Zayn around the ring. 
All the way around the ring, Nakamura slides out and catches Miz with a big kick to the face. Back into the ring, Kinshasa's going to connect. One, two, three. Nakamura is still the WWE Intercontinental Champion. This was a solid, solid, fast-paced match here. Nakamura has looked pretty pretty good since his return, actually. Like, he's got some new life breathed into him. I think all that surfing is actually might be doing his soul some good here. Uh, like I said, uh, Zayn and Nakamura together, they just might be the ticket. I think it's a good blend of the two. I think Sami Zayn being able to talk for Nakamura. I didn't like it at first. I thought it was kind of thrown together, but I, I think Nakamura is, is a little more comfortable out there with somebody talking for him. Like I said, the, these two guys just had instant chemistry, and I was actually really, really surprised. I think we all needed to also take a minute to really appreciate what we have in The Miz, because The Miz has come a long way as a worker, too, and he's a pretty, pretty serviceable worker now. Three and a quarter star. Call me surprised. Oh, here we go. It's time for the big one. The man versus the blueprint. It's the Raw women's title match. Becky Lynch is going to be defending her championship against Sasha Banks. And the crowd is hot and into this one right off the bat, guys. Sasha does a phenomenal job with her heel mannerisms for the entire match here. She's in character. She's just a natural heel, right? Strong work from both women as they work a pretty hard-hitting match. It only suffers from the WWE syndrome. This match was built as a blood feud, basically. And uh, they're hitting each other with chairs and, you know, they're talking all this trash leading into this match. The day comes to the big show, and then they just have a plain old wrestling match. Uh, yeah, I know it's chapter one in the story, but we could at least have a little progression, I mean. They didn't have to be all out full out hitting each other with chairs the first week. We could have eventually got to that because it's pro pretty obvious this feud's probably going to continue and roll on for another pay-per-view. This is the WWE we're talking about. It usually happens in threes, right? Sasha ends up getting a hot near fall with a top rope Meteora later in the match. And then they're going to end up going into a nice big uh, reversal sequence as they fight over the bank statement and the disarmor. A pair of backstabbers is going to lead to Sasha finally getting the bank statement on, but Becky's going to make the ropes. And then you know what Sasha Banks says? She's just had enough. And you know why she's had enough? Because she's a heel. And she manages to hit Becky Lynch with a chair in the rib cage behind the ref's back. That's going to get a 2.999 hot near fall. So Becky ends up getting the chair. Swings it at Sasha. Sasha moves. And Becky just barely taps the referee like right here with it. Yeah, it was, it was almost like a Gerald Briscoe on Stone Cold Chair Shot from Circa Survivor Series 1998. But guess what? That ref is, by God, he's dead. He's got a family. Can we get a... Uh, can we get this dead ref, this dead ref's body removed, please? Because he's just laying in the ring unconscious for like 10 minutes. I'm pretty sure he's got brain damage because I don't even think they ever, he ever came to. They never got him out of there or nothing. It's just kind of bumming people out with him laying in there. Becky and Sasha are going to end up brawling into the crowd and they're going to end up back up onto the concourse. They brawl all the way back down into the ring. Becky's going to get control of the steel chair, and she just starts wearing Sasha Banks out with it. She even pro opens the chair up, sits in it, and pulls Becky Lynch's arm up, or uh, Sasha Banks' arm up through the opening of the chair. So she's basically performing the disarmor while sitting in the chair in a really cool little visual. A bunch of refs are going to hit the ring. Pat Buck, I think, is one of the agents that comes out, and they're going to be out down to pull her off. And it's announced that Becky Lynch is disqualified for striking the ref with the steel chair, but she's going to remain the champion. This was a good story. I mean, this match needed some kind of crazy overbooking like this to, to kind of set it apart and to try to build to a second chapter. Um, especially if they were going to try to get them into the hell in a cell. They're, they were going to need some kind of crazy overbooking here to ex not only explain that logical step to get inside of the cell, 
but they had to throw some gasoline on them and build that fire up a little bit more here. And I, I thought they did this. It made me want to see a little bit more from them. It made me want to see a decisive winner. I think both ladies worked really hard in this. I mean, yeah, the finish was crap, but what are you going to do? you got to get a second match out of them. You can't beat either, either woman. Good segment. The crowd was into it. We're going to go three and three quarters of a star. Finisher aside, fun match, fun segment, and it fit the story. All right, moving right along. The championship hits just keep continuing here at Clash of Champions. The WWE Championship is on the line next as Kofi Kingston he attempts to continue his storybook run as champion as he defends the title against Randy Orton. And these guys, these two are going to take their time uh, getting anything going here. And fans seem to be willing to go along for the ride. Orton does a pretty good job of uh, doing all of the little heel things uh, that he should right away. Uh, little, little cowardly things, like he gets into a chopping uh, contest with Kofi where they're chopping each other. And just the way that he's selling it, he's like, oh, oh, like this when Kofi's chopping him. It's just the little ways that he's selling his facial expressions, the way he's trying to walk away from Kofi when he gets chopped. And then, then after everything, he just ends up uh, catching Kofi with a thumb to the eye instead. So good, good heel work there. Uh, Orton is going to end up doing the, uh, I call it the WCW NWO revenge spot where Kofi's on the apron. Randy's going to charge into him and knock him from the apron into the guardrail. And then Orton is going to follow Kofi out on the floor and just brutalize him. He's going to suplex him on the floor and then he's going to get the big backdrop suplex where he drops Kofi straight down onto the announce table. Uh, Kofi's going to end up getting hit with the RKO back in the ring, but he gets his foot on the rope to break up the pin. And then Orton, is, Orton says that's it, and he's going to go for the punt, which we haven't actually seen in a while, so it's kind of cool to see him bust the punt back out. Kofi is going to block it with trouble in paradise, and that's going to be it. One, two, three. Kofi Kingston puts the Viper down. He devenomizes the Viper, guys. Defangs him, if you will clean in the center of the ring with trouble in paradise uh and this was definitely a I, I think it's pretty obvious randy orton called this match the pace was just too deliberate for it to really uh be anything more than just pretty good it never really got out of second gear basically it started to get there with some of the near falls at the end but i could have used a little bit better pacing during it i feel like orton kind of slowed things down uh, clean finish though, which I, and I think the, that the right guy went over. I think Kofi going over Orton clean. They're going all the way with Kofi, and you got to commend him for that. I, I mean, I thought maybe there would have just been a little PR run that he would have got earlier this year, and he would have dropped the title quickly. With them coming up to Fox, let's see what happens. I still think uh, we're gonna we're gonna be getting Brock Lesnar versus Kofi pretty soon. Maybe with Kofi chasing Brock in the title, especially with the move to Fox. So. Stay tuned, as like they as they like to say on the blog. Let's see it. Let's let it play out and see where it goes. Three and one half of a quarter. Or, sorry, three and one half stars for Kofi Kingston and Randy Orton. All right, and now they've been spending a lot of time building this angle up on TV. It's the uh, the Who Done It angle with Roman Reigns and Eric Rowan. They botched this angle pretty badly on TV, so... This is a no-DQ match. Roman Reigns going one-on-one -on -one with Eric Rowan. And the crowd is actually starting to die now after the WWE title match, which is a little sad to me because this crowd was one of the best WWE crowds I've seen in a very long time. Um, they were hot. Hot old wrestling crowd, basically, is what it seemed like. And they're starting to get exhausted here. Uh, Eric Roman in a prominent pay-per-view position uh, against Roman Reigns will probably do that to the crowd, though. It'll probably take a little bit of the air out of him. Uh, Rowan is going to end up controlling early on by using the ring steps, and then he's going to actually expose the padding off of the LED board on the apron, which I didn't even know there was any padding on there. And uh, Roman's going to get slammed into that exposed LED board. And then there's a... There's a pretty crazy little spot where uh, Rowan is going to catch Reigns as he goes for a springboard Superman punch off of the ring stairs. 
Rowan's going to catch him and throw him up into a pop-up powerbomb and just drive him right through the announce table. Pretty cool visual. Really, all they needed to do in this match is just follow the Braun Strowman, Roman Reigns blueprint, and you could have had a big star in Roman here. Rowan is smart. He's going to roll Roman Reigns into the ring to try to catch a pinfall, but that's only going to get 2.9 off of the uh, pop-up powerbomb through the table. Back into the crowd, they go a brawling, and Rowan is going to put Roman Reigns right through it. Uh, a table by the uh, the, the production uh, it's like the TV equipment the production equipment production setup there's a table out there and Rowan's gonna iron claw slam Roman through the table these guys are gonna end up back up on the entrance stage and uh, Roman Reigns is gonna end up commandeering the uh, camera jib this time and he's gonna use that on uh Eric Rowan to get a little bit of revenge for Rowan using the camera jib on him. Superman punch on the ramp follows up and and Rowan rolls all the way down the ramp. It looks like Reigns is setting up for the spear. He gets the taunt off and he charges full speed. Right into a Luke Harper big boot. That's right, Luke Harper is back, guys. He's been MIA since the... WrestleMania weekend, basically, the uh, world, When Worlds Collide uh, 205 Live NXT, NXT UK shows, that was his last appearance. He hasn't been on a main roster show now in probably a year, almost, with WWE, so this is pretty crazy stuff, and this comes just days after Dave Meltzer had a big report that Luke Harper would be sitting out the remainder of his career, or the remainder of his WWE contract, until around April 2020, and that Vince McMahon basically had absolutely zero interest in using Harper. If you remember, he had asked for his release on Twitter, uh, most likely to join AEW, but it looks like they've worked things out here. Wow. Ouch, old Dave Meltzies. I guess plans changed, right? I feel like this is some kind of combo of uh, Eric Bischoff and Bruce Pritchard getting together to uh, try to discredit uh, Meltzer in any way, shape, and form that they can. A little, a little funny, especially with the way that Bischoff in particular has been going off about the dirt sheet writers being full of baloney. So, hmm. Food for thought, right? Ow. Anyway, back in the ring, Rowan is going to plant... Roman Reigns with the Iron Claw Slam. One, two, three. I bet you never would have saw Eric Rowan going over with help from Luke Harper. This was a fun little match, though. I felt like they were just getting started. I would have liked them to see these guys go ten more minutes and just bust out all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, it could have been a, the, as it was, the match was fun for what it was, but it could have been a, a lot of fun. And there was a nice little genuinely shocking surprise here. Three and three quarters of a star. We'll see how that one plays out. But Luke Harper back, Bischoff playing some games with the uh, old DM, right? Moving on into our main event of the night. The former Raw Tag Team Champions are about to explode. The WWE Universal Championship is up for grabs as Seth Rollins is going to be putting the title on the line against Braun Strowman. Let's get right to it. As apparently, again, they're going for the same tired opening to every match because Braun is going to bulldoze uh, Seth Rollins to start the match and take him out. I'm actually really, really sick of that that way to start matches tonight. It's it's really been overused. Seth is going to fire back and chops Braun down with a series of super kicks, but Braun is going to kick out before even the uh, a one count on a frog splash from Rollins. Braun takes over on Seth and the crowd just goes sleepy. I don't know what the I don't know what the deal is, but the crowd just dies horribly as Braun takes over here. Even to the point where Renee Young has to make an awkward comment uh, about it. Seth tries to make a comeback to literally zero reaction. But Braun cuts him off again. 
having these guys work twice in one night, I think it's apparent now. I don't. I think they they kind of had an inkling that it wasn't going to be a very good uh, reaction for the main event, but it really did. I mean, they WWE already has problems keeping fans interested for the whole show, let alone booking these guys to do double duty. Uh, they've already been seen not only in the opening match losing the titles together, but they've been in multiple shots backstage preparing, walking to the ring, cutting promos themselves. Yeah. And hopefully they learn something here. I mean, if this was Extreme Warfare Revenge, uh, we would have gotten a message that Braun Strowman and the, the crowd started to get sick of Braun Strowman and Seth Rollins because they were uh, overused on the last show. Braun ends up taking... Braun ends up going over top of the announce table, and Seth Rollins is going to fly with a suicide dive to follow up. He hits that suicide dive, and Braun's going to fall onto the announce table, and it's just going to crumble underneath him just like that announce. Remember the announce table uh, in the Rock-Austin match at WrestleMania 7? It just explodes when I think the Rock is on top of it. Silly. There's a sick spot where Braun Strowman channels the spirit of Daiseki Sakamoto and uh, thinks he's in Big Japan Pro Wrestling BJW for a minute because Braun hits a freaking top rope splash onto Seth Rollins. It's a crazy visual. That only gets a two count. The, crowd, the crowd's really this dead, which is surprisingly af even after that. Seth ends up firing back with the curb stomp, but Braun kicks out, and I'm actually surprised because I bought that as a near fall. Second curb stomp hits, and that's got to be it, right, guys? Braun surprisingly survives, and he kicks out at 2.9. Another good finish. Another good false finish. A third stomp hits, and Braun kicks out again. This is, it's actually turning out pretty good now. Way to keep Braun Strowman strong. A fourth curb stomp is nearly blocked into the power slam, but Seth ends up slipping out, and he hits the pedigree, guys. I love that. That's like him digging into his All Japan Pro Wrestling bag of moves. That's like his top tier move, like uh, Kenta's burning hammer, right? He only busts it out when he absolutely has to. I like that aspect a lot. Fourth stomp, finally finishes, one, two, three. Braun ain't getting up from that, and the crowd really couldn't care less. Uh, yeah, they, the crowd goes mild, to say the least. Strowman and, Sh and uh, Seth worked very hard here. I actually really loved the finish with uh, Strowman surviving and uh, Seth having to bust the pedigree out, dig, like like I said, having to bust out a top tier move that he usually doesn't use. Really cool stuff. Fun match. I wish the crowd would have been a little bit more into it, but it's understandable with them already working earlier. Post match, the Fiend is going to make a surprise appearance and jump Seth Rollins from behind. Sister Abigail on the stage, mandible claw, and that's going to be your the image that we're going to go off the air with. With the fiend over top of an unconscious Seth Rollins. Awesome stuff, and it's a pretty cool visual. We're going to go three and one half star for the match. All right, guys, now it's time for the bottom line on WWE Clash of Champions. What is the bottom line? Well, WWE Clash of Champions, it was a very, very well-paced show. That's a big, big improvement uh, for what WWE has been done doing lately uh, with their pay-per-view events on the network. Sometimes they just feel like they go on and on and on for hours and hours and hours. And sometimes I really don't want to sit and watch them for hours and hours. Especially when you have all of this quality wrestling going on now. Uh, solid, solid wrestling. But there's really nothing stuck out as amazing. But nothing was offensively bad either. Uh, again, these are, these, shows, these are just shows of little consequence. But they often just feel like filler. Or uh, or bumps in the road until we get to our next destination, which in this case is Hell in a Cell, <coughs> which is a little bit bigger of a marquee show for the fall. Usually the show after SummerSlam isn't too big, especially here is kind of considered an afterthought. 
so to speak. Um, it's, I can't give the show a thumbs down because there was some solid stuff on it. And it's it's hard to not... It, we're going to give it a marginal thumbs up. We're going to say thumbs up, almost leaning to thumbs in the middle. Just because nothing ever reached over the mediocre point. But the pacing of the show was uh, was really well done. I think they took some logical steps building to Hell in a Cell next month. And, yeah, solid stuff, guys. Solid stuff from WWE Clash of Champions. And we hope that you thought that this episode of the J to Z TV Pro Wrestling Breakdown was solid stuff as well. We're going to be checking out a lot more action. Coming up, we got NXT on USA on Wednesday night. Stay tuned for that. We've got AEW on TNT coming up in a couple of weeks. Stay tuned for that. We will be breaking that down as well. And we want to advise everyone to go right now. Check out www.blogofdoom.com. Scott Keith, he is the pro wrestling connoisseur. He's the guy that basically shaped my entire uh, fandom as a pro as a young wrestling fan reading his stuff growing up through my teenage years guys that's what shaped me into this basically this super fan that i am today with all of this knowledge it's thanks to mr scott keith he's shaped my taste and uh we really enjoyed appearing on the blog of doom today as special correspondents for the blog of doom we hope for the next uh, big wrestling show that we will be the special YouTube correspondents for the Blog of Doom. Hit that like button. Let us know in the comments down below what you thought. And check out the Blog of Doom, Scott Keith, and all of his awesome wrestling writing, recaps, contributions, journey down wrestling, memory lane, all of that and more at the Blog of Doom. Until next time, guys, we're going to see you down that aisle and through those ropes. Thanks for watching.